your country around Hudson Bay, Canada's vast northern inland sea, was granted to the Hudson's Bay Company by Royal Charter of 1670. Some 800 miles above the Canada-U.S. border, Hudson Bay narrows at the south into James Bay, a second and smaller inland sea. On the eastern shores, the company established its first two fur trading posts, Rupert House on the Rupert River and Moose Factory on the Moose. Of Moose Factory, the company annals tell, 1671, established by Pierre Esprit Radisson. 1686, captured by French fur traders. 1713, returned to company under Treaty of Utrecht. And still today, a busy fur post. In deep winter, most of the Indian men quit the post for trap lines. Past summer schooners, beached clear of tide and spring ice, only the odd man remains to saunter down to the company store. But the time-honored sign and the company's local manager and his clerk mean that every so often the men will return to trade their furs for store goods, food, clothing, tobacco. Moose Factory is a key post for the Hudson's Bay Company at James Bay. Here, as at other important posts in isolated areas, a government doctor is stationed. He cares for the Bay's scattered native population of Cree Indians. And Royal Canadian Mounted Police now enforce the Dominion's laws in these remote districts where, until 75 years ago, the Hudson's Bay Company did what it could to keep the peace. Today, the Mounties are almost as much a part of any post as the manager himself. Invariably, they are on the best of terms with him, for in isolated areas, the few whites soon accept that spirit of full, free, willing give and take which frontier life demands. Hudson's Bay posts are meeting places for all who live or travel in the north. Everybody stops in for supplies, for general news, for personal messages. In winter, dog team is the chief means of getting from one post to another. The Moose Factory Mounties want a letter delivered up the coast to one of the Hudson Bay Company's trading agents. Handing the letter to the company's local manager, they ask him to see that it leaves Moose Factory with the first dog team heading up James Bay. George McLeod, progressive Indian, trapper and dog team freighter in winter, boat mechanic and guide in summer, leaves next day for his trap lines at Hannah Bay, some 50 miles up the coast. The manager arranges with George to take the Mounties' letter and also to freight some supplies for the company over the first flap of the journey up James Bay. drags the loaded sleigh down to the flat of the river, where other men are ready to help him hitch the excited dog. The small loops of individual dog lines are slipped over the large fastening loop, or pito, at the front of the sleigh. A haul on the pito starts the runners, and whit, whit, the straight-ahead driving call of the bay starts the seven dogs down the trail. Sand hitched, as teams are in Canada's eastern Arctic, where travel is over open, treeless space, George's dogs go past the settlement and near his home on its outskirts. While other Indian trappers may have their families with them at trap lines in the bush, George leaves his at the post, where his children can go to school. The neighbors standing by will keep an eye on the dogs, while George, in white man fashion, kisses his children goodbye, and then, stolidly, Indian style, shakes hands with his wife. Along the shores of the bay, and of every stream flowing into it, high tides thrust up ridges of ice, apt to catch the runners of a loaded sleigh. Stuck sleigh and tangled lines invite a fight, and the dogs fresh and excited are white for one. Drivers are always on the alert for flights at the start of a trip. 
They can't have lame, chewed up dogs on the long, hard, lonely winter trail. Order quickly restored, the driving call of Hara Hara turns the team left along the tide mark of the Moose River, where high tides have overflowed and frozen in a wide, smooth van. Soon the tall green bush of the riverbank has changed to the low willows of the bay. Far out, rime vapor from open salt water becomes a cloud in the cold, still air. For winter temperatures on the bay range from zero, freezing the natives call it, to 50 below. Natatishi and Big Stone is there the green bush for sheltered winter camping on the two-day trail from Moose Factory to Hannah Bay. At Natatishi, spread of the fan hit shows how easily it gets into line for narrow bush trails. December daylight fades fast. Quickly, the unhitched dogs are chained for the night. Then, at the sleigh, the ropes holding the load are unlashed from the notched ends of the flat cross pieces. The load's cover by day is George's tent by night, put up on the three-pole frame peculiar to the Bay Area. Your dogs, George, are more important than anything on the trail. Start cooking their one meal of the day. <laughs> to snow melted in the dog kettle over the fire, a half pound of beef fat is added, then a pound of rolled oats per dog. When the feed is cool, each dog's portion is poured out on the snow before him. George's own meal is almost as simple. Tea, best drink for the bush, bannocks, scone-like biscuits, and meat, usually game, fat fried. Only dry foods and nothing canned are carried on the winter trail. Next morning, the fan hitch again changes to tandem down the bank at Natatishi. Along the shores of the Harakana River, high tides have raised the ice into barrier walls. George's axe is always ready. The bush saying is, a man is naked without his axe. Ice conditions like this are usual on the winter bay, when abruptly, without warning, bright northern skies in December darken, bring angry wind and storms. at Hannah Bay, the trading point halfway between Moose Factory and Rupert House, with an Indian population of five or six families. The team approaches the bank on which, among the small Indian tents and beside the larger trading tent, is Hannah Bay's one building, the shack where the trader lives. Men away on trap lines, only women, children, and the aged are in camp. To hear the team and to see who is arriving, they come from their tents among the teepee-like winter wood piles. But Edward Corson, trading agent for the Hudson's Bay Company, is already greeting George. And they enter the floored tent where Corson deals in camp trade goods. So Indians don't have to make the long trip to Rupert House or Moose Factory every time they need supplies. Seeing where George has gone, the Hannah Bay natives return to their stove-warm tent. Inside the unheated trading tent, George examines some new traps arranges for the care of the dogs while he is away on his lines, explains about the company supplies he has freighted up, and delivers the Mounties letter. Pitching camp at Hannah Bay, George's days become like those of any of the Indians who are the only trappers in the district. They may live right at their lines from October through April, but freighter George visits his traps as often as any of them. 
He is on his lines at least once every three weeks. Next morning, George starts for his trap line 25 miles away in the bush. They cover an area which, for generations, has been the recognized hunting and trapping grounds of his family. Through close and open seasons, Canada's provinces today set definite trapping periods for the various furs. Trapping, anyway, is a casual occupation with a high element of chance. A trapper can only set his traps, leave them, and then revisit them in a week or two. Where he steps from the Hannah Bay firewood trail to the deep snow of the bush, George puts on the long, crease-style snowshoes used in the Bay Area. With a twist of the raised foot, he slips his moccasins into the lampwick lacings of the harness, which are permanently adjusted. Once on snowshoes, George is able to move with ease over deep drifts to cover 15, 20, 25 miles a day. On George's back is pack sack with food, blankets, trapping equipment. Again, his axe is ready. The sub-zero nights of the trap line trail are passed in the open, evergreen boughs for bed, campfire for warmth. Always a fur upon which bay trappers depended, beaver has recently decreased, is today especially protected. Each trapper limited to 10 during the five-week open season ending December 21st. George needs only one more for his quota when, a week before the season ends, he arrives at a small beaver dam on his trap line. After testing the ice at the dam, where eddies often weaken it, he goes to examine the house, under whose snow-covered dome he expects beaver are wintering. He pokes his axe handle into the house. He hears the frightened animals splash through the underwater entrance, escaping to their washes, burrow-like dens, and the runways leading upstream. A little distance above house and dam, and all the way across the creek, George chops right through the ice. Here, he builds a barrier of stakes. When a beaver which has been scared away seeks to return downstream to the house, or when one that may have remained in the house tries to get upstream to its food supply of poplar sticks, the barrier blocks the way. The animals are forced to swim along the stakes, searching for an opening. George has left such an opening at one side. Here, he chops the larger hole for the trap and sharpens a sturdy willow with which to stake it in the stream. As the trap beaver is powerful, he makes sure the anchoring chain is securely tied to the willow. Bait is not necessary. The gap in the barrier forces the animal to pass over the trap and risk being caught. George is slow, methodical, and skillful as he spreads the strong double spring jaws. One slip and the trap would snap shut on his hand. Finally, he has the jaws in the position where their catches will lock. The trap is ready for him to lower it into the water and drive down the mooring stake. Ordinarily, George would leave several gaps and set a trap in each, but as he only needs the one skin, one trap is enough. He hopes to have the beaver when, in three days, he returns homeward bound for Moose Factory, where he wants to be for Christmas and New Year's, when most of the trappers will be at the post. Earlier, George has seen signs of mink further up the creek and has set traps there for that animal. Searching for food, mink scuttle under the overhanging icy banks of streams. A blazed tree tells George the location of a little evergreen shelter or cabin which he built to house the traps. The frozen body of a mink has been protected by the cabin shelter. Above the reset trap, George places the bait, rabbit, partridge, or fish, stuck between the split end of a willow. He hides the steel jaws under dry grass. He will carry the mink with him, and when he camps for the night, will skin it, eat the flesh, and stretch the fur on a trowel-shaped wooden board to dry. The mink on the pack sack will bring between $10 and $15. Pack sack heavier, George approaches a swamp where he has traps for fox. These are set in the open, staked down over a pile of brush, the hole hidden under snow, with rank bait on top. 
Rewarded again, another five or ten dollars. Pack stack still heavier, George continues around his line. Trap sprung, reset it, conceal its steel with dry grass, snowshoe on to next, reset, and on again. And so the three days pass as George tramps over his lines, completes their circuit, and is on his way back to the creek where he has set his last beaver trap. If he has caught a beaver, George decides to do something trappers seldom do, camp by the dam and dry the pelt. He has caught his beaver. He skins it immediately. Then, with twine, he laces the skin to a willow hoop. This is usually the Indian women's work, but when alone, and they have to, Indian men can do it too. Dealers never have any trouble with improperly dried furs if Indians have done the job. The skin tight on the willow stretcher, George hangs it up to dry. In a few days, it will be ready. When it is, he unlaces the skin, now stretched and dry, to be rolled up for the trail. During the three days he has camped at the dam and revisited some traps, George has feasted on beaver. Indian trappers count on the animals they catch for much of their winter meat. The 30-pound beaver carcass is cached for his next trap line round before George buckles the rolled skin in his pack sack and starts back to Hannah Bay. Outside his tent at Hannah Bay, George takes an old precaution of the bush. He hangs his snowshoes well out of reach of any dog which might break loose during the night. Snowshoe babiche webbing is tempting food for a hungry sleigh dog. With such simple precautions, George is ready to turn in early, for tomorrow he must be on the homeward trail. Next morning, tent struck, load balanced, tightly lashed, the simple harnesses of canvas webbing are slipped over ready forepaws before the sleigh is dragged to the river. George is again the bay freighter, handling dogs, live animals, not the dead ones of the trap line trail. Again the cry, whit, whit, and George has started his seven dogs on the two-day trail back to Moose Factory. afternoon, George nears Moose Factory. His freighting for the company will add a few extra dollars to the 50 or 75 his trap line round will bring. He counts on from three to five hundred dollars as total return for an average trapping season. Though, if it be a good one and the price is paid high, he may net as much as seven or eight hundred. George can dispose of raw furs only to a licensed dealer like the Hudson's Bay Company, whose manager not only buys the furs, but pays government royalties and fills out all forms necessary for the sale. George has freighted down some furs for other Indians, but these will await the arrival of their owners. Each trapper likes to do his own trading. Hello, George. Get the supply safely up to Hannah Bay for us? Oh, that's good. And you have some furs to sell me. Here, let's see them. The manager is a fur expert, and his appraisals are just. He judges by color, by thickness, by luster, by consistency, and most importantly, by size. The color of the mink is good. 
The beaver is not the blanket or largest size, but medium, $25. George asks for settlement in cash, not store credit. Now he has money for the holidays, and before he returns to his lines, he will enjoy Christmas and that big Indian day, New Year's, with his family at Moose Factory. And so the trappers come in from the bush, the white children return home from far away city school. An active settlement long before most of the country much farther south had any towns at all, the old northern post of Moose Factory warmly welcomes another holiday season to the cold and barren waste around James Bay. <laughs> <laughs> 